All right, so questions. Good to go. All right, well, let's talk about number theory. So we, we did a little bit of a lead into this on Wednesday. I mentioned prime numbers, and I mentioned um, Goldbach's conjecture, the idea that every uh, even number can be written as a sum of two primes. As an example of the fact that lots of things we're going to talk about for the next couple of classes um, are really easy to describe and discuss, but can be really tricky to actually like formally analyze and prove. And that's sort of characteristic of number theory. It's one reason it's a popular subject with a lot of people. So let me start with a definition. So a number, we're going to talk about integers. We're pretty much going to stick with integers. So I'll say a number, but I mean an integer. A number n is divisible by another number d if there exists an integer k such that n equals k times d. So there's a fairly formal definition of divisibility. So 10 is divisible by 5 because we can write 10 as 5 times something. 21 is divisible by 3 because we can write 21 as 3 times something. Okay, 21 is not divisible by 5 because we can't write 21 as 5 times some integer. It's five times four and a quarter, but it's not five times an integer. So from this, this one definition, we're going to get a whole lot of stuff uh, that comes out of it. So other things we can write, we can write D is a divisor of N. We can write N is a multiple of D. We can say D divides N. And we have a special notation for this statement, D divides N. And you got to be really careful when you write it because it looks like something else. The formal notion of this is D vertical bar N. Okay, so when you see this, D vertical bar N, it means D divides N. And if you're writing in a hurry and you're kind of sloppy, this can morph into, into this. And then it can start looking like D divided by N, and that's not what it is. OK? So this is D divides N. N is divisible by D. D is a divisor of N. N is a multiple of D. Or more formally, N equals D times K where k is an integer, a member of the set z. But we'll use this, this symbology a fair amount. So put it on your notes somewhere. This means d divides n, or n is divisible by d. And we can start stating and proving a bunch of theorems about divisibility. For example, so here's a theorem. If D divides N and D divides M, and my pen doesn't run out of ink, Then D divides N plus M. So if two numbers are divisible by D, their sum is also divisible by D. Yes? Divisor is like saying it's a factor of? Yes, it's a factor of. 
So how could we prove this? Well, we're told that D divides N, and we're told that D divides M. Those are premises. The definition of D divides N means that N is equal to D times some integer K1, where K1 is contained in the integers. And since D divides M, M is equal to D times K2, where K2 is an integer. And now if we just add N and M together, we can write it as d times k1 plus d times k2, and we can factor out the d. So n plus m itself is equal to d times k1 plus k2, and of course k1 plus k2 is also an integer. So we've just written n plus m as d times an integer. What can we conclude from that? d divides n plus m, because that's the definition of divisibility. And so lots of these things are really, really short, simple proofs that come straight out of the definitions. So if two numbers are divisible by D, so is their sum. And not surprisingly, so is their difference, because we could just do a subtraction here, and that would pop out. And there's other things we can show also. If D divides M and C is an integer, then D divides C times M. And that's not startling either. Right. If m is divisible by d, then 2 times m is also divisible by d. 507 times m is divisible by d. Right. So multiples are divisible. And so you can put those together. If d divides m and d divides n, then d divides any number times m plus any other number times n. So linear combinations, if you're in 215, of m and n are still divisible by d. Here's another one. If a divides b and b divides c, then a divides c. C is a multiple of B, B is a multiple of A, then C is a multiple of A. So how would we prove that? Just shout out steps. So oh, is it, we have to take advantage of the, um, it's not just A is divisible B by B, but B is also a multiple of A, which means that C is a multiple of B, meaning C is a multiple of A. That's what you're trying to show, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's kind of like, it almost seems like you can just do some kind of weird... Yeah, just yeah. A weird permutation of the chain rule. Okay, so let's, let's write a weird permutation of the chain rule. <laughs> you just say that A is equal to some integer K times B, and then replace A and K with B and B. Okay, be careful. So this says A divides B. So B is a multiple of A. Okay, right. So so let's start off with A divides B. That's a premise. Let's write B equals A times K. That's the definition of divisibility. And then where do you want to go? Can you take A times K and substitute it for B and the B divides C? Okay, so let's do B divides C. That's a premise. So C equals B times J. That's a definition of divisibility. And now we're going to substitute this version of B into here and say C equals A times K times J. Let's substitute 
2 into 4 for b. And now I'm just going to note that k times j is an integer. And therefore, c is a times some integer, so a divides c. So using this idea of divides or divisibility, what does it mean when we say that a number n is even? How could we express that in terms of divisibility? Divisible by two. Yeah. If 2 divides n, it's even. If it's even, 2 divides it. So that's the whole notion of, of being even. We're just saying our number is divisible by 2. What about an odd number? It's a little trickier. The number plus 1 is divisible by 2? Nice. If 2 divides n plus 1, then n must be odd. Why? Because this says n plus 1 equals 2 times k, so n equals 2 times k minus 1, which is almost the definition we had for an odd number. We can turn that into 2k plus 1 pretty easily. But we could have also said n divides, or 2 divides n minus 1. That's an equally good definition of an odd number. And that'll show you directly that n is equal to 2 times k plus 1. So p is prime if and only if. How do we express being prime in terms of divisibility? And it's not divisible by anything else, right? So we could say if n does not divide p for all n uh, contained in z, n bigger than 1, and not equal to p. So if for all integers bigger than 1 and not equal to p, those integers don't divide p, then p is prime. And similarly, p is, so what do we call the number if it's not prime? Composite. Composite. So p is composite, or we could say not prime, if and only if there exists an integer n bigger than 1, not equal to p, such that n divides p. In other words, p has an interesting factor. So we can capture all kinds of, of concepts with a few symbols if we know about divisibility. All right, why do we care about divisibility? Um, divisibility is going to help us move into kind of a parallel universe that's much simpler than our universe. So our universe, um, we have these things called integers and there's a whole lot of integers. And if we want to prove some fact about integers, we have to prove it about every single integer, and there's an infinite number of them. Or if we want to know that, that there's no integer that satisfies some criteria, we've got to check every single integer, and there's an infinite number of those. It's a lot of work. We're going to find kind of a parallel mathematical world where there aren't so many integers. In fact, there's going to be a finite number of integers. And things that we do in this simplified world will sometimes reflect back on our world. And we'll be able to make conclusions or find answers to questions about all integers by looking at this smaller set. And so this is the idea of modular arithmetic. And things like prove that if a number squared is odd, then the number must be odd will be trivial to do in this simplified world.
So we're looking at modular arithmetic. And there's this fancy thing called the division algorithm. It's a theorem, and it's got tons of, of letters and ifs and else's and things like that, and I used to teach that. And I think it's way more confusing than it needs to be. So I'm going to give you a practical version of the division algorithm. But if you hear division algorithm, this is what we're talking about. Um, so we're interested in remainders. Okay, we're, we're, we're talking about the percent operator in C. Divide one thing by another, tell me what's left over. Okay, so this is uh, the modular operation. Um, so how does this work? 17% 3 means divide 17 by 3, tell me the remainder. So what is 17% 3? What's left over when you divide 17 by 3? 2, right? So 17% <laughs> 3 equals 2. Um, how about 19% uh, uh, 5? 4, right? Because 15 and then you got 4 left over. Um, how about 22% uh, 11? So everybody knows how to do this, okay? And I can go into the mathematics of this and make you completely forget how to do this, but I don't want to do that. Um, you, you understand how the percent operator works, right? Divide this by this and see what's left over. Okay, so here's, so, so you can always come back to this. It's your touchstone, right? Um, but here's a more uh, rigorous way of defining this. So 17% 3 equals K means 17 equals 3 times some integer. Let me call this R for remainder. It means 17 equals 3 times some integer plus that remainder. Okay, in this case, 17 is equal to 3 times 5 plus 2 left over. So R is equal to 2. That's what 17% 3 is. 19 can be written as 5 times some integer i, 3, plus a remainder of 4. So 19% 5 is equal to 4. So here's a potential complication. If all I'm trying to do is write 17 as 3 times an integer plus r, what stops me from doing this? 17 equals 3 times um, 4 plus 5. That's 3 times an integer plus some remainder. So maybe 17% 3 should be equal to 5. Because that is a remainder when I divide 17 by 3. Or I could write 17 equals 5 times 4 plus negative 3. So maybe 17 percent, oh, I didn't do that right, um, multiplying by 3. 17 equals 3 times 6 plus negative 1. So maybe 17 percent 3 should be negative 1. So all of these are valid remainders. They're valid answers for what's left over when I pull out a bunch of 3s. But we all converged to this as the correct answer. Why? The remainder needs to be greater than or equal to zero and less than divided by Exactly. So the remainder needs to be bigger than or equal to zero and less than the thing we're dividing by. Because otherwise, you're in you know, second grade or whatever grade they teach division in, and they say, what do you get when you divide 17 by 3? And you say, well, I get 0 plus a remainder of 17. Technically, that's correct, right? 17 is 3 times 0 plus 17 left over, but you don't get points for that. <laughs>
So you got to take away as many threes as you can, but not too many. Here we took away too many, right? And we ended up with a negative remainder. Here we didn't take away enough. We could have taken away another three. Bless you. Here we took away just enough. Okay, so this thing called the division algorithm is a theorem that always says there's a unique number that satisfies this property and sits between zero and your number minus one. But it just says we're gonna we're gonna kind of agree when we say what are these things equal to, right? But it can get a little weird when you have negative numbers. So and if you go into C and you use percent on negative numbers, it can get strange. So uh, negative five percent three. Well, we could say negative 5 equals 0 times 3 minus 5. We could say negative 5 equals 1 times 3 minus 8. Negative 5 equals 2 times 3 minus 11. And these aren't the remainders that we're interested in. So let's go the other direction. Negative 5 equals negative 1 times 3 minus 2. Negative 5 equals negative 2 times 3 plus 1. Negative 5 equals negative 3 times 3 plus 4. And here's the one that we like. Because the remainder is between 0 and 2. So this should give you a 1. I don't know if C actually does that or not. I suspect. I hope it does. But when we talk about what's the remainder when you divide negative 5 by 3, we'd want the answer to be 1. Okay, so we have our own way of writing these remainders. So let's go back to our first ones. So 17% 3 is equal to 2. What we would say is 17 is congruent to 2 modulo 3. This means when you divide by 3, you get a remainder of 2. So 17 triple equal sign 2 means 17 is congruent to 2 modulo 3. And it means when you divide 17 by 3, you got 2 left over. So 19 is congruent to 4 modulo 5. 22 is congruent to 0 modulo 11. And you have to mention the modular. And you have to mention what modular you're working in. Yeah, what model. Well, there's an interesting, yes? So are you going to do RSA math? Do what? RSA math. I don't know. What is that? Or like just RSA math? Like the RSA algorithm? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get to that at the end. <laughs> yes. Um, we'll go through a public key crypto system. So, and everything that we do in this unit is going to come into play in that. <laughs> All right. Um, so an interesting equivalent statement to this, suppose we say 17 is congruent to 2 mod 3. This means uh, 17 is equal to 3 times some integer plus 2. Well, if we take 17 and we subtract 2, that's equal to 3 times some integer. In other words, 3 divides 17 minus 2. And we can generalize that. Suppose that um, A is congruent to B modulo M. This means A is equal to M times some integer plus a remainder of B. And if we subtract B from both sides, A minus B is equal to M times some integer 
which was our definition of m divides a minus b. So if a and b are congruent mod m, m divides their difference. And that's going to be really useful for us. Now we are allowed to write this. That's an absolutely perfectly valid statement. 17 is congruent to 5 mod 3. And all we're saying is 17 minus 5 is 12. That's a multiple of 3. We're also saying the remainder when we divide 17 by 3 is the same as when we divide 5 by 3. Right? Because 17 is also congruent to 2 and 5 is also congruent to 2. So when we, when we do 17% 3, we want C to give us one number, 2. We don't want it to give us a choice. Could be 2, could be 5, could be 8, right? But we can, we can definitely say something like 17 is congruent to 5 modulo 3. That's perfectly fine. Bless you. So <clears throat> here's what we can do. We can fix some modulus. Let's just think um, let's just think mod three. So fix some modulus. For example, mod three. We can take any integer out there and we can say what is that congruent to mod 3 and it's going to be congruent to either 0 1 or 2 right because we're going to require that that our answer is bigger than or equal to 0 and less than 3 minus 1 is 2 so any integer we can write it as being congruent to either 0 1 or 2 mod 3 okay so here's a cool little fact um, If A is congruent to B and C is congruent to D, then A plus C is congruent to B plus D. And you can work through the definitions and see this pretty easily. Right? So 3 divides A minus B, 3 divides C minus D. You can prove that this minus that is also a multiple of 3. So this means if we have two numbers and we want to add them together and see what it's congruent to mod 3, we could take a plus c, two really big numbers, add them together and calculate what that's congruent to mod 3. Or we could see what a is congruent to mod 3, which is a small number, and see what c is congruent to mod 3, which is a small number, and then add those small numbers together. And that's going to tell us what our, our sum of big numbers is also congruent to. So this is our step into this, this sort of parallel mathematical world where we can start with big integers, but we can reduce them to small integers, basically between 0 and whatever our moduli is, minus 1. And we can do our addition over here on these small numbers. And this also works with multiplication. So um, if A is congruent to B and C is congruent to D, then A times C is congruent to B times D.
No, because division messes things up. <laughs> and we'll see why in a bit. We can do subtraction. So we can do addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Division will be kind of quirky, so kind of like matrices. Division's always a bit of a trick. Okay, well, let's see what we can do with this. Um, let's see what 2 to the 10th is congruent to modulo 7. Now, we could take 2, we could multiply by itself 10 times. We're going to get 1,024, and then we could divide that by 7, and we'll get something. I think we end up with a remainder of 1. But here's what else we can do. So 2 to the first is just 2. So that's congruent to 2. 2 squared is 4. What's 2 cubed? Eight. That's 8. And what's 8 congruent to mod 7? That's just one more than a multiple of 7. So 2 to the fourth well, that's 2 times 2 cubed, and I know 2 cubed is congruent to 1, so this is congruent to 2 times 1, which is just 2. 2 to the 5th is 2 times 2 to the 4th, and since 2 to the 4th is congruent to 2, this is congruent to 2 times 2, which is just 4. 2 to the 6th is 2 times 2 to the 5th. And 2 to the 5th is congruent to 4, so this is congruent to 2 times 4, which is 8, which again is congruent to 1. 2 to the 7th will be 2, 2 to the 8th will be 4, 2 to the 9th will be 1, 2 to the 10th will be congruent to 2. So I was off by 1. So let's see if we were right. So 2 to the 10th is 1024, 1024 minus 2 is 1022, 1022 divided by 7 is 146. So 2 to the 10th is 2 more than a multiple of 7. And clearly there's a pattern here, 241, 241, 241. And that pattern repeats. If I wanted to find 2 in the 901st, that's going to turn out to be congruent to 2 also. Because I can play this pattern. But I never had to work with anything bigger than 8 over here. right? If I had enough patience, I could find 2 to the millionth and see what that was congruent to mod 7. And the things I'd be getting over here were always numbers smaller than probably 16. Right, so this is really easy to do. This is potentially really, really large and cumbersome. And this is part of how we do things like crypto systems like RSA, um, because a lot of these crypto systems would depend on being able to do very large arithmetic operations. Take this, this string that contains you know, 50 digits and raise it to this power, which itself contains you know, 319 digits. And it's a really large arithmetic operation to perform. But we don't actually take that thing and multiply it by itself a gazillion times, right? We do tricks like this working in a modular system, and the operations are much simpler. And we'll learn a few tricks that we can use along these lines. All right, so, so we're doing things on the set of all integers over here. We're working in some reduced system over here, working modulo something. So what are some of the properties? This, this is like a, a different kind of algebra, OK? So matrix algebra is different from algebra of, of normal numbers. Working modulo 7, we get a totally different algebra. So we still have commutivity, right? 2 times 3 is going to be congruent to 3 times 2, because 2 times 3 is equal to 3 times 2, so the remainders will be the same. Um, 
there's an identity element for multiplication. So if um, so, a times one is always going to be congruent to a because a times one is just a. So we have this this multiplicative identity. Um, we have an additive identity. A plus zero is congruent to A. So we got a zero and a one, which is nice. But here's a question. Does there exist a B such that A times B is congruent to one? In other words, is there a multiplicative inverse for any number a other than zero? We know zero never has an inverse. Well, the number four definitely has an inverse because if I take four and I multiply by two, I get one. Right? We're still working mod seven. So four times two equals eight, which is congruent to one. So the inverse, or the reciprocal, if you like, of 4 is 2, which might feel a little strange. And the inverse of 2 is 4. But 1 half is not an integer. Right, so the only things we have over here are integers between 0 and 6. But there is an integer between 0 and 6 that when we multiply by 4 is equal to 1 or congruent to 1. Right, so that's why 2 is an inverse of 4. But yeah, it's kind of like 1 fourth is equal to 2. Yeah. And the 4 to the minus 1, we think of that in school as 1 over 4, but we don't do that here. Yeah? Finding the inverse in general, I think, is a little more complicated than that. So, like, what's 5 inverse equal to? Is there an inverse for 5? Is there something we can multiply 5 by that's congruent to 1? $100 for the first answer. Invisible money. Something you multiply 5 by, that's one more than a multiple of 7. Okay, so 5 inverse could be 10. How about something between 0 and 6? Three, right? So five times three is fifteen, is one more than a multiple of seven. Fourteen. So five turns out to have an inverse, three has an inverse. One is usually its own inverse because one times one is equal to one. Zero is not going to have an inverse because there's nothing times zero that's going to give you one. Because when you multiply by zero, you get zero, and zero is different from one. So mod 7, we got lots of inverses. So let's, let's see what this looks like in general. So we can fill in one of these tables that we use in school. And so on. And what you'll find is that every row and every column has a 1 in it. That's how you know that everything has an inverse. So let me do a simpler one. So this is mod 7. 
This is multiplication. Let's do multiplication mod 6. So our numbers are from 0 through 5. So 0 times anything is 0. 1 times anything is just anything. Assuming I did that right, there's your multiplication table, modulo 6. So what looks potentially strange in here? Yeah. <coughs> Don't have what? Yeah, yeah. There's rows and columns that are missing ones. Right? There's no ones in here. There's also no ones in here, and there's no ones in here. And what do we find in here instead of ones? We got zeros in here. So this entry tells us 4 times 3 is congruent to 0, right? This is all mod 6. 4 times 3 gives you 0. Is that weird? What do we do in algebra if a times b is equal to 0? We say, so either a is 0 or b is 0. All of a sudden, that no longer applies. Because here's a product that's equal to 0, but neither of the things we're multiplying is themselves 0. So that's a different kind of beast. So we have what are called divisors of 0. And that changes things. And there's numbers with no inverses. There's nothing we can multiply 3 by that gets us negative, that gets us to positive 1. And that's tied into this. So why does 7, everything has an inverse, but with 6, some things don't have inverses? What's the difference between 7 and 6? 7's seven a prime number. And it's going to turn out, if we're working modulo a prime number, then everything other than 0 has an inverse. And we have no 0 divisors. And if we're working modulo a non-prime number, then there will be things that don't have inverses. And we'll have 0 divisors. Uh-oh. We're getting into that forbidden knowledge now. <laughs> <laughs> so prime numbers permeate all of this stuff. And it's another one of the reasons why prime numbers are key to doing crypto systems. Because things are nicely behaved when you're modulo or prime, we can invert some of these multiplication operations. And when you're not prime, we lose information. If we know the product of two things is zero, we don't know if one of them was zero or not. They might not have been. Uh, let, let's do a five minute break just because I'm feeling talkative, so I'm going to go the whole time otherwise. So let's take a five-minute break, and we'll talk about fun stuff. Let me show you some other things we can do with modular arithmetic. Um, so suppose we want to do 3 to the 17th mod 7. 
Right, we can do what I did before where we multiply 3 by itself 17 times and we keep reducing mod 7. But we can do even less work. So here's what we can do. We can say 3 to the 1 is just 3. 3 to the 2 is what is congruent to squared, which is 9, and 9 is congruent to 2. Okay, I'm not going to do 3 cubed. I'm just going to square this side. 3, three to the 4th is the square of 3 squared. And since 3 squared is congruent to 2, 3 squared squared is congruent to 2 squared, which is just 4. 3 to the 8th is the square of 3 to the 4th. And since 3 to the 4th is congruent to 4, 3 to the 4th squared is congruent to 4 squared which is 16, which is congruent to 2. It's 2 more than 14. And 3 to the 16th is 3 to the 8th squared, which is just 2 squared, which is 4. So I can do this and really quickly calculate all the powers of 3 raised to a power of 2. 3 to the 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 5, 12, 4,096, and so on. Really easy to do. And to find 3 raised to the 2 to the n takes me n operations. So this is very efficient. Okay, well, I can take the number 17, and I can write this in binary. And that tells me that 17 is equal to 2 to the 4th plus 2 to the 0. So 3 to the 17 is 3 raised to the 2 to the 4th plus 2 to the 0, which is also 3 raised to the 2 to the 4th times 3 raised to the 2 to the 0. So exponents, if we add in the exponent, we can take them out and multiply them. This is how slide rules work, by the way. So 3 to the 17th is going to be congruent to 3 to the 16th times 3 to the 1st. And I've calculated 3 to the 16th is congruent to 1. 3 to the 1st is congruent to 3. So this is congruent to 12 which is congruent to 5 mod 7. So with less than a page of hand calculations, I found 3 to the 17th is 5 more than a multiple of 7. And so 3 to the 17th minus 5 is this number. And this number divided by 7 is exactly that number, 18 million. So when I was a kid, I liked geeking out on prime numbers, and and my steam name is still Prime Minister, um, 37 of course because it's prime. Um, so so I was always coming up with these formulas to generate primes because nobody has a formula to generate primes. There's no thing you can just turn the crank and prime numbers pop out the other side, right? We haven't found one of those. So I was always trying to come up with these formulas and. And basically, I would just come up with a number that was so big that I couldn't tell that it wasn't prime, but it looked prime. You know, it wasn't even, it didn't end with a five, it's probably prime, right? <laughs> so um, I found this, this professor at Illinois, his name was John Selfridge. Um, he'd written some books on number theory that I liked. And I wrote him a letter, you know, very formal for like a 12th grade, 12th year, 12 year old kid. Um, and you know, I believe I found a formula, blah, 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 blah. blah. And I sent him some big number with like 18 digits in it, right? And he sent me back something like this. It was a paper tape from a calculator. And, you know, he said this has a factor of such and such. And he showed me how he found it by hand. Just do it. He didn't use a computer or anything. It was just simple calculations like this. And it totally blew my brain <laughs> that, like, you could work with these big numbers with all these digits and, and find things about divisibility by doing simple calculations. Yeah? They just found the new largest prime number last month. Oh, cool. And it's 24 million digits long. Excellent. So let's... Um, <laughs> it's like 2 to the 82 million power. Yeah, so the last one I memorized as a kid was 19,937. Um, and that was a while ago. So let's find a list of these things. I think it is a Mercine Prime. Yeah, they're, they're all Mercine Primes at this point. Um, 
So we'll talk, we'll talk about what Mersenne primes are. They're primes of a particular format, and we don't know that numbers of this format are always prime, but it turns out that if you take two and raise it to a prime number and subtract one, sometimes that's prime two. Sometimes it's not. Okay, if, if this is a prime number, it's called a Mersenne prime. Mersenne was a mathematician who studied them. And all the largest primes we found are in this form. So, um, so if your prime number is 2, uh, 2 to the 2 minus 1 is 3, that's a prime number. So that was discovered 430 BC. 3 is another prime, 2 to the 3 minus 1 is 7, that's prime. 2 to the 5, 2 to the 7, those are all giving you prime numbers. 2 to the 11th minus 1 is not prime. Okay, 2 to the 11th minus 1 is 2047, and that's not a prime number. Even though it sounds prime, um, it's divisible by something. I wonder if there's like some fundamental law of mathematics that in the future they'll find, and they'll look back at this, and they'll have their lecture, and they'll be like, instead of saying, back then, our community... Back in the Stone Age. They, they cared a lot about rational numbers. Yeah, they'll, yeah. They'll be like... They build everything off prime numbers. Right, right. No sense. Yeah. <coughs> so yeah, 2047 is 23 times 89, which is kind of a cool set of numbers. Um, so 2 to the 13th gives you a prime. So now we're up to like, you know, the mid 1400s before that was discovered, and they didn't want credit for it, apparently. Um, and this was done with trial division, so just dividing, right, what I just did there. Um, so 1800s, Lucas. A uh, mathematician came up with a test <laughs> called Lucas Lemur test um, for testing numbers of this form. So if 61 that gives you a prime, it's kind of big. So they tell you how many digits these prime numbers have. So the number of digits starts growing. And we're still in the 1800s here. Here's a 39 digit prime number, which is pretty cool for like 1876. Right? We didn't even have MTV back then. And we were able to find these big primes. And then we jump ahead into when we had computers. And so now we're getting these multi-hundred digit prime numbers. Um, <coughs> 1950s still, right? So this is big iron days, the big room-sized machines. Um, and then we kind of jump into the, ninth, the uh, late 70s. So this is some of the supercomputers, uh, Control Data Corporation and Seymour Cray's babies, the Cray one, and so on. So what we considered supercomputers through the 80s and 90s, and the size of these numbers is just getting huge. So there's a 4 million digit one found in 2001. And um, you start seeing this thing, GIMPs. So this is the great internet Mersenne Prime search. Um, a play on GIMP hunting. And this was a screensaver you can download for your PC. And when you're not using your PC, it'll test for prime numbers. And it talks to a server, it gets the number that it's working on, and it just runs this Lucas test to see if it's prime. And if you get a prime number, your name shows up on here under the Wikipedia page eventually, right? So these are, are mostly just individuals. Um, right? So someone's Pentium 2, um, someone's Athlon T-Bird, a Dell dimension, right? So you can, you can put those spare cycles to good use. There's research grants if you find certain numbers in certain categories that look right. for. Right, yeah, so there's, so there's there's variations of primes. Um, so yeah, so December 7th uh, last year, there's a 24 million digit number that yeah. you just mentioned. And that's the 51st Mersenne prime that's been discovered. Um, and it's got 24 million digits. And it was done on an Intel Core i5. <laughs> so uh, LLT, that's the Lucas Lemur test, so that's what GIMP's using. Um, and this crowdsourcing of, of CPUs, GIMP was one of the early ones, SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, they had a SETI at home. And you could, your screensaver would talk to the server and it would get a patch of signals that had been picked up and it would analyze it for signatures of, of hydrogen and oxygen to look for markers of, of intelligence. Um, and now there's all kinds of things you can do with screensavers. There's things that are looking at like cures for cancer and protein folding and stuff like that. Um, but GIMPs was, was one of the early ones. So, so Mersenne primes are fairly rare. Um, it's an interesting footnote on M42 million. It was found by a machine, but no human took notice until two months later. All right, so that's, that's a collection of prime numbers. <coughs> 
and they're pretty far apart, but because of the Lucas-Lemur test, primes in this form are easier to check than just sort of arbitrary numbers. Um, So how many people here have heard of Fermat's last theorem? It's been on Star Trek. It pops up in science fiction. Um, notice I implicitly did not include Star Trek as science fiction there. Um, <laughs> So we know this is true. 9 plus 16 is 25. And that corresponds to a right triangle. So Pythagorean theorem says the sum of the squares of these sides is equal to the square of that side, which is not what the scarecrow says in Wizard of Oz, by the way. He defines a different kind of triangle accidentally. Um, so this is interesting because if you take tiles of a fixed size, you can put four of those tiles along here, and you can put three of those tiles along here, and if you lay those tiles out along here, they fit perfectly, right? That's what it means to say that each of these is an integer. So the Greeks were interested in this, and they wanted to know, well, what other numbers satisfy this property? Um, and this is another one. Right, 25 and 144 gives you 169. And there's a whole bunch of numbers that satisfy this. Now there's also silly numbers that satisfy this. Right, that's obviously true, but that's not terribly interesting. And this is obviously true, but it's not terribly interesting. But if we don't allow zeros or, or negatives, right, this is somehow pretty cool. This is somehow pretty cool. And the Greeks got pretty far in studying when you have equations of integers that satisfy this property, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where a, b, c are in the integers. And they found a general form for the solution of this. <coughs> and analyzing that can take you into all kinds of interesting areas of mathematics, like algebraic geometry and, and complex analysis and things like that. So, um, kind of the natural question, if you're inclined to think this way, is what about this equation? What about three numbers whose cubes add up like this? And again, we're going to ignore the obvious things. Negative 1 cubed plus 1 cubed is equal to 0 cubed, right? But the interesting solutions where these things are, say, positive integers, um, are there numbers where this is true? And it was discovered that there's no such integers ABC that satisfy this equation. And it's a fairly complex proof. But it turns out you can't satisfy this in integers. So Fermat a mathematician was reading a book by a Greek mathematician named Diophantine um, and there was a section of the book that talked about a squared plus b squared equals c squared a cubed plus b cubed plus c cubed and in the margin of the book he wrote a note saying um, there is no solution to this in integers furthermore for any n bigger than 2 there's no solution to this equation. There's no integers ABC that ever satisfy this for anything other than n equals 2. And he just wrote this in the margin of his book, and he said, I've discovered a marvelous proof of this, but this margin is too small to contain it. And then sometime after that, he died. <laughs> Not like as he was writing it, like in Monty Python, but you know, somewhere before he, he actually put the proof down anywhere. Um, and so after he passed, someone was going through his effects and found this book and was flipping through it and discovered his note in this margin saying that you can't find a solution for this. And they're like, oh, this was Fermat's last theorem, <laughs> right, that there's no solution to this. And so people wanted to find the proof and publish it as Fermat's last theorem. <laughs>
And so began a search for a proof that there is no solution to this for any n bigger than 2. And it took a long time and took hundreds of years. And lots of people thought they came up with proofs and inevitably after they published, somebody would go through the proof and they'd say, oh, there's a problem in your proof. And a lot of times the problems in the proof had to do with things like this. Like assuming that if two numbers multiply to zero, one of them must be zero. So a famous error in one of these, um, it turns out with prime numbers, you can take a number that's not prime, you can write it as a product of primes. Right, so over here we looked at this number 2047, it's actually 23 times 89, <coughs> 23 and 89 are prime. And it turns out that if you can do this, it's always unique, other than the order. So 2047 is 23 times 89 or 89 times 23. It cannot also be equal to 17 times something else. Right, when you write a number as a product of primes, it's unique. That's not always true, it's true with integers, but in other number systems it's not always true. And somebody assumed that that was a universal truth and they came up with a really nice proof of this. And somebody pointed out, oh, in the system you're working in, that factorization does not have to be unique. And in, his name was Coomer. And in trying to fix his proof, he created these new types of numbers called ideal numbers that would let him restore this unique factorization. Didn't get him to a proof of this, but he created an entirely new branch of mathematics called ideal theory. So this one simple problem, right, it's trivial to state, has spawned so much mathematics and so much imagination towards trying to understand either how to prove this or finding a counterexample. Find some value of n where you can actually solve this. So this was finally proved in the early 90s. And it's a beautiful proof that I can only barely begin to understand the very outer edges of. Did they think that Fermat actually proved it? Or no. He just sort of the consensus it? is he probably had a quick proof and it just had some error in there. And since he hadn't written it out, presumably had done it in his head, it's pretty easy to imagine. Um, and the way it was finally proven was using some very advanced techniques in algebraic geometry that weren't discovered until, you know, a few decades earlier. And they just weren't available in Fermat's time. So unless he had some completely different insight that's just eluded you know, people for, for centuries, um, he probably did not have a proof. But the final proof of this um, um, came out in algebraic geometry. I was an algebraic geometry student at Duke when this was breaking, so it was really exciting um, to know that this was going on. And there were like cash prizes and good stuff like that. Um, there's always cash prizes for number theory questions, by the way. So if you want to like spare spending money, you can solve some of these and make some cash. Um, so this, this is totally classic number theory, right? <laughs> Simple statement, really easy to get your head around what it's asking, and deceptively difficult to actually, um, to actually solve one way or another. So that's Fermat's last theorem. Um, and you can look up the proof online and, and see all about its history and so on and so forth. Um, we will talk about something called Fermat's Little Theorem, which is proven, and we'll use that for some other stuff in number theory. But Fermat's last theorem um, is referring to this. All right, well, we've got a few minutes. Um, so how do we test to know if a number is prime? I mean, if, if we don't do something fancy like, like a Lucas Lemur test or something like that, in general, someone hands you a prime a number and, and wants to know if it's prime, how do you tell? Yeah, so, so this is what I did here, right? I just started dividing by, by prime numbers and eventually I found one that divided it. And if I had kept going and I got all the way up to 2043 or whatever the last prime is and I didn't find a factor, I could say it must be prime. So, so this trial division is a pretty standard method. It's just really slow. If your number has 24 million digits, that's a lot of prime numbers to check. And you don't have to divide by primes. You could divide by every number between 2 and your number minus 1. <laughs> 
and then you don't have to worry about generating primes, but that's, that's even more numbers to test. Um, so let me show you a method that was known to the Greeks. This is called the sieve of Aristosthenes, and it works like this. I don't know how far I'm going to go. I might be stuck in a feedback loop. I'll go up to 30. I lied. Go up to 35. So you write all your numbers out. Here's, here's what we do. We start with the number 2. We circle that, and then we cross out every second number. Bam, 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 bam. All right, go to the beginning of your list. Find the first number that's not circled. Circle that. Cross out every third number. Go to the next number in your list that's not circled. Circle that. Cross out every fifth number. So that takes out 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. 35. And you just keep doing this. So there's a 7, cross off every 7th number. There's an 11, cross off every 11th number. There's a 13, cross off every 13th number. There's a 17, cross off every 17th. There's a 19, there's a 23. There's a 29, there's a 31. Guess what? We circle all the prime numbers. And it's just saying if a number is divisible by 3, then it's going to be, you know, some number of steps of three numbers past 3. Right? So we're just kind of doing the inverse of looking to see if it has a factor. We're crossing off all the things that are multiples of 3, multiples of 5, multiples of 7. And what you're left with is, is a bunch of primes. So that's one way to generate primes, but it's, it's pretty expensive. All right, and I'll just leave you with the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which we already talked about, but I didn't call it that. So the fundamental theorem of arithmetic fundamental theorem sounds really powerful. Arithmetic, not so much. So it's a mix. Um, but this is the statement that when you, when you take a number and you write it as a product of primes, that product is unique. Okay, so, so 1,001 equals 7 times 11 times 13. There's no other way we can write it as a product of primes other than, you know, 11 times 7 times 13. So we have this unique factorization. And it's a powerful result. All right, so we'll continue on this on Wednesday. No school on Monday. Um, your homework is pushed back to Friday. So Wednesday, we're going to talk more about prime numbers. We'll talk about how they relate to cicadas. Um, we'll talk about some open problems. And, um, and we'll work our way up to applications. And yeah, you have a program due somewhere in there. All right, have a great weekend.